Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. I'm going to tell you how it's going to be. You'll be listening to us three and have a lot of fun tonight. Um, I've always been fascinated by you know, these short periods of time that started a long-lasting renaissance and what influenced you know, the person or group or did you know the idea start – uh, you know, the culture, you know, the cultural uh, creativity for that time period. There's a, you know, a little bit of both. You know, uh, what was the uh, lasting legacy? Um, 1959 was one of those moments in American history, and several of the Nightlight guests have connections to that. Possibly overlooked Renaissance. Um, let me just run a few of these examples by uh, like Greg Martin from the Kentucky Headhunters uh, re- recorded as uh, uh, the band uh, recorded a CD with Johnny Johnson, you know, Chuck Berry's piano player. Uh, Arlen Roth has Steve Cropper and Albert Lee on his Telemaster CD. Uh, both will be playing at the Buddy Holly 85th birthday concert this Saturday in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, bassist Eddie Denise also plays bass for uh, Dion DiMucci, who was on the Winter Dance Party Tour. Uh, Merle Fankhauser has done West Coast tours with Jan and Dean. They uh, did a Southern California tour with Richie Valens, and Richie's brother Mario is to be at the Buddy Buddy Holly birthday concert. Uh, Arlen worked with uh, Don McLean of America, uh, American Pie uh, fame. Um, which covers much of tonight's show. Um, Arlen recorded with Dwayne Eddy. No relation to me. Uh, but uh, uh, Dwayne is hosting the birthday concert. Um, Elvis's pianist, uh, Glenn D. Harden, worked with Albert Lee on Emmy Lou Harris's luxury liner. And Arlen recorded with James Burton, Elvis's guitarist. You know, so, you know, a couple of the crickets appear on uh, Clapton's first solo CD, and Clapton has done a lot of recordings and performances with Albert, and Albert played at the concert for George, which brings us back to the Beatles and crickets. And so when we get, get into that, uh, and I'm sure I'm missing uh, you know, several other ones, but, you know, it's... Um, uh, just uh, you know, j- just fascinating to see all these uh, connections, and you know, when I had a chance to, the second time I met Albert, 
three years ago, you know, he realized I was working with Oral and spent you know, a little bit more time with me than you know uh, than some of the other people who were um, you know trying to get autographs and you know, I'm just um, deeply appreciative of you know someone of his stature, yeah, you know, taking some time out for me and I you know, just create like you know, those concert stories. I was like, oh my gosh. You know, Met, met this person and, and you know, things like that. You know, little things like that just uh, create lifelong fans for him. And you know, probably somewhere in the second part of the show, um, you know, we'll be uh, talking about um, another momentous event that happened in 1959. You know, the Twilight Zone uh, premiered, and we've had. Uh, Mike Pfeiffer, Mark Olshaker, Bill Mooney, and Serling as guests, and yeah, you know, they, they've met um, met Rod. So, um, sorry about needing a flow chart for that in- introduction, but um, <laughs> it's just really, I, I, I've just uh, been really. Uh, Amazed by the, the connections Night Light has had to um, history, and so if you want to learn more about the Buddy Holly birth 85th birthday concert, you can go to uh, BuddyHollyHall.com and. You know, for the Serling Fest 22, you can go to RodSerling.com. Um, we have lost lots of listeners in Austin, Texas, so uh, well, head over to the concert. My, you know, it's kind of a far drive, but um, I'm going to support a fellow Texan. Um, so anyhow, we have Gary Clevenger, who has written extensively on Buddy Holly and the Crickets. As and the crickets were a legendary band on their own. Um, he's been a fixture at the Serling Fest as well. And our other Buddy Holly and Rod Serling Twilight Zone scholar is Ryan Vandergriff, and he has several books documenting. The Winter Dance Party and the Mysteries of Flanders Field. Hi guys, how you doing? Doing, doing good. good. How about yourself? Oh, hey, I'm I'm fine. I'm just, uh, <laughs> hope I didn't uh, lose all the listeners with that I- intro, but I, it, it's I'm just kind of amazed by all all these connections uh, to this time period and maybe um we should you know start with um buddy's background um you know, Gary do you want to uh talk a little bit about his background and you know just I I think with both of our um Themes tonight, uh, Buddy and Rod. Um, I mean, we we can look at uh, you know the creative process, but you know, we'll just focus on Buddy right now. Well, uh, how, how did he, he grow up and uh, basically change the world? Well, Buddy grew up with a family that loved him, and uh, actually, as he got older, and you know. Uh, you know, began to show his musical talent. Uh, you know, his family really supported him 100% of the way. So, um, you know, I'm, I was just sitting here thinking about a few minutes ago that there was, um, you know, you're asking me about his interest in music, and I'm thinking back to uh, one of the uh, documentaries on his life, and uh, that basically said that, you know, in the early 50s and, uh, um, that there wasn't a lot to do. So, you know, uh, 
everybody at one point would either sing and they'd pick up a guitar or learn how to play the piano or whatever, you know. And uh, I would say the the first thing that really was, um, like I said, Buddy grew up in a musical family, you know. Uh, so um, there was a talent contest, and his two brothers were playing in the talent contest, and uh, Buddy wanted to play along with them. But uh, so, you know, uh, Larry and Travis, um, uh, Buddy's brothers, they thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll let him come up on stage and uh, we'll, we're going to put oil on his bow. So when he, hit, when he hits the strings, you won't hear anything. So uh, <clears throat> they performed a song called Sailing Down the River of Memories. And... Um, the talent contest, there was a $5 prize that night, and, and even though uh, Buddy could not make any noise um, uh, from the instrument that he was playing, uh, they won the, the $5 contest. So, And then after that, uh, just pretty much just his interest took off from there. Okay. It, it, yeah. And... and it, from some of the, you know, vi- videos, you know, you know, you have a very informative book, uh, you know, the crickets, uh, six decades of rock and roll memories, and you know, you do have uh, a lot of biographical material in that book as well, but. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I was watching a lot of uh, videos, you know, just YouTube videos to prepare for the show, and uh, he, he was uh, one video uh, had someone. Uh, I think it's the pastor of um, the church, and I, uh, I assume the church is still standing. The I believe that's the uh, tabernacle. I believe it's the tabernacle church. Is that yeah. right, Gary? That's tabernacle. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And he he was uh, singing in the church choir. You know, his family was involved with uh, the church. You know, very, very closely. Uh, yes. Um, uh, both brothers, Larry and Travis, were, were, were deacons in the church, and the family did uh, attend church regularly, you know, almost like probably every other person uh, did back in, in those days. You know, Sunday, it was the day you went to church. So, uh, yeah, and, um, you know, there was all kinds of things that, you know, I would say probably helped Buddy hone his sound, you know, uh, you know, singing with his family and, uh, you know, singing in the church. And, uh, you know, his, his friends would get together and they would, you know, try to come up with songs or whatever. And, um, you know, there was just always music was all around. If you weren't playing it, somebody else was. So, you know, and if you didn't know how to play, there was somebody willing there to probably teach you so. So yeah, okay. so yeah, music was pretty prevalent around that time. Okay, and uh, Ryan, when was the band Buddy's like first bands formed, and you know, we're kind of building up to the crickets. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, What's that story? Well, you know, uh, Holly gigged around Lubbock for, uh, you know, quite a while with a lot of, uh, you know, amazing musicians uh, like Jack Neal and uh, Bob Montgomery and, uh, of course, Sonny Curtis. Uh, you know, and over time, you know, uh, you know, these guys, they would, you know, they would form, you know, these sort of de facto bands and uh, they became quite well known throughout uh, Lubbock. Uh, uh, I mean, and there there were, there were different bands. There was uh, there was Buddy and Bob, of course, which was Buddy Holly and uh, his uh, childhood friend Bob Montgomery. Uh, I mean, 
you know, and they, it, was all, it was all kind of building up to the crickets. And it's funny, the the one constant was always Buddy Holly. You know, uh, there's sort of this uh, this focal point, you know, of this you know musical fraternity, if you will. And you know, uh, musicians came and and went, but Holly was always the constant, and it was always building up. It felt like to the crickets. It was, I don't know how you know certain things happen, but there are these perfect marriages. You know, certain musicians come together, and uh, if ever there was a, a great I mean, a quartet beginning, uh, which would be Buddy Holly, uh, you know, Jerry Allison, Joe B. Malden, and Nicky Sullivan. I mean, these guys came together and formed such a, a an amazing sound. Uh, it, it really, you know, it, it sort of set the precedent for, you know, all these other musicians to follow. And it's it's boggling to think how young these guys were when they started out. You know, it just uh, to this day, it really just flabbergasts me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about what? How old were they at this time? You want to? You can jump in here and help me here, Gary. Uh, uh, I know that obviously they started off. Uh, I mean, I know Holly. Uh, there's some recordings of Holly uh, when he was just 13 years old. On acetate, uh, they started off very early. Uh, so we're, I'm thinking, you know, 13, 14. Would that would that be about right, Gary? Junior that would be high. And and actually, speaking of that, you know, uh, just talking a few minutes ago, it got me to thinking that it was probably about 10 years ago or so. And they are on YouTube if you want to listen to them. And I know they've been released on CD, but uh, you know, they're always looking for. Uh, you know, the Lost Buddy Holly tape, or, uh, you know, it's uh-huh. got to be around somewhere, the recordings we haven't heard. But about 10 years ago, there were two songs that were uh, Buddy and Jack, which would have been Buddy Holly and Jack Neal. And the two songs, uh, I Saw the Moon Crying Last Night, and I Hear right. the Lord call, Calling for Me. So, like I said, if you have any interest or your listeners have any interest, they can check out those songs on YouTube. They are actually really quite good, and they uh, really do have good sound quality. So, uh, yeah, something to check out. But uh, like Ryan was saying, you know, they started out pretty young. The earliest recordings was like around 13, 14 years old, you know. And, um, you you know, uh, at... Um, I was going to say something, forgot what I was going to say. Um, you know, and uh, Jerry Allison was the closest in age to Buddy. He was like, if I remember correctly, like one or two years younger than Buddy. So, um, yeah, they were all very young. And like I said, their careers didn't last very long, but what they accomplished in that short period of time. Nobody mm-hmm. could do that. Nobody could do that today. And if I could jump in real fast sure. uh, and sure, uh, just touch upon something that Gary said uh, in passing about Jerry Allison, uh, I, I think Gary joins me in saying that uh, Jerry Allison and Buddy Holly were kind of the Lennon McCartney of the 1950s. I, they weren't. I, Jerry Allison wasn't just Buddy's side man. They were real partners uh, in every sense. Uh, uh, they wrote together. They played together. I mean, uh, I just you cannot, uh, in my opinion, you can't underestimate. You can, just can't understate the importance of Jerry Allison to the Buddy Holly story. Without one, you don't have the other, right? <laughs> that that's one hundred percent correct. Because, like I said, in everything that I've heard, you know, uh, Jerry knew what Buddy was going to play before Buddy played it. So he knew, you know, that they had played together for so so long. They knew what each other needed. So, and uh, like I said, Ryan's one hundred percent correct on that one. So, so where uh, did the name the Crickets come from? <laughs> you take that one, Gary. It's a great story. Yeah, yeah, it's actually it's actually a pretty good story. You know, they were um they were thinking about a name for the band and they were thinking, uh, well, you know, we'll come up with an insect name. And so they're sitting there, they're looking through the uh dictionary and they came across spiders. And uh there was a uh there was a a record that was put out by a group called the Spiders 
uh, is called Witchcraft, which if your listeners aren't familiar with that, that's also on YouTube. And there's a uh, <clears throat> there's a beat in that song that is the same beat that uh, Jerry Allison decided he was going to replicate for Peggy Sue. So, um, but they decided they were going through. They said, "Yeah, spiders." Now that's already been used. Then they thought, "Well, they kept looking around. They saw crickets, and they thought, well, there's a lot of crickets. Crickets in Lubbock. Crickets make noise. We'll just call ourselves the crickets.'" And then that's how that came about. <laughs> is it? Uh, I, I'm going to jump in. Is it true, Gary? Do you think, uh, or do you think it's just sort of more legend about uh, how at one point Allison? You know, looked at the word be- uh, Beatles, and they, they momentarily considered that. Or do you think that's more? Do you think that's become more of a kind of a legend? Do you think there's any truth to that story? Or um, well, I, 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 you know, uh, I think there is probably some truth to that. But they decided to go with the crickets. You know, a perfect uh, choice. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, and the thing about it is, is. Um, <clears throat> You know, the Beatles changed it, their name, because they, you know, they, they really adored the crickets. And they thought, well, mm-hmm. oh, we, can't, we can't use crickets. That's already used. So then they came, <laughs> across, they came across Beatles, and they thought, well, B-E-E-T-L-E-S. No, we're not going to do that. Let's make it B-E-A-T <laughs> for beat. You know, it, it goes with music, and we'll call ourselves the Beatles. And then that's how that came about. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you got us to the point where um, Buddy has a band, and they uh, and you know, I was just uh, watching one of the YouTube videos, and they opened for Elvis, and you could see uh, Elvis walking through the crowd, and there's uh, like Buddy and Jerry Allison, uh, um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of like you know, shell shock. Like, oh my gosh, you know, there, there's Elvis right there in front of us. So, uh, yeah, you know, well, they seem to have been able to get uh, enough attention to open for, you know, like. You know the biggest name in uh, music at that time, well, but to to put that in um, uh, proper framing, though, uh, at that time Elvis was very much up and coming. He had an incredible buzz about him. I mean, the industry was you know uh, as the industry always is. They're you know always talking amongst themselves. Uh, but Presley wasn't quote Elvis at that point. He was still Elvis Presley, the leader of the uh, the Blue Moon Boys, I believe, uh, and uh, so. Uh, he was getting a name for himself, but not so much so where it was improbable that, you know, Holly, you know, could, you know, open for the guy. So, but it was, and that footage you're talking about, my gosh, it's beautiful, it's glorious. If your listeners ever get a chance, definitely jump on YouTube. It's uh, it's in uh, color, and it's uh, it's all silent, of course, but it's uh, just a really nice little uh, peek behind the door of rock and roll history. You know, I, I, I always just you know when they zoomed in on uh, Buddy and the uh, crowds, like oh there there he is. It's like <laughs> it's you know, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's like two two of the huge names uh, of you know the t- you know that that time uh, right there in the same room. So so um, okay let. Let's move on to, you know, the first recordings and you know, going to Clovis, uh, New Mexico, and meeting with Norman Petty. What uh, what's some of the, you know, what is your research revealed about um, that that period in Buddy's life? Gary, this is your specialty. I'll let you take that one. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, okay. Well, let's say the one thing about it is, is Clovis was 90 miles from Lubbock. So, you know, it was a heck of a lot easier to go to Clovis than it was to jump in the car and go to Nashville. So, uh, but, but of course, Buddy did make a trip to Nashville. We can talk about that in a few minutes. But, uh, sure. but uh, the one thing about it is, is there, uh, um, Norman Petty was a very, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the correct wording here. He, he he was like the Phil Spector of, of the early 50s. He knew what he needed to do. Uh, he he knew, you know, uh, when musicians came in there, um, how the sound should be and should I move this piece of equipment or should I move this speaker, should I this... And you know he was a he knew everything about mixing. Uh, I don't know if you, if your reader, excuse me, not your readers, your viewers will ever have a chance to take a look at this book. But there's a book out there by a gentleman by the name of Frank Blanas, B L A N A S. It's called The King of Clovis, and it, and it pretty much goes into uh, the life and times of Norman Petty, and you know it talks about some of the techniques that he used with all the people that came through there. Because you got to remember that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, Buddy Holly and the Crickets weren't the only ones that came through there. You know, you had Roy Orbison, you had, you know, you had others coming out there too. So, yeah, uh, Clo- uh, the Norman Petty Studio was um, was the place to go. So, um, uh, it seems like I was going to say something else. I can't what I was going to say, but. Uh, um, the other thing they liked about it, because I'll tell you, um, I don't know if Ryan, I'm sure Ryan's made a trip out there. I know I made a trip out there. But one of the things the guys enjoyed is that um, <clears throat> Norman never charged by the hour for the recordings or for per, per session. You know, if it took you 20 minutes to do a recording, fine. If it took you two days, that's fine. It was all, you know... Um, that's the way they did it back then. But the one nice thing about the Norman Petty Studio, excuse me, <coughs> I, have a, I have something in my throat there, but uh, the one nice thing about the Norman Petty Studio is not only was it a studio, it was a functional home. So if you were recording and you decided, well, I want to go get something to drink or a sandwich or I want to lay down for a little bit, you know, you didn't have to get in your car and, you know, fly all the way back to Lubbock and then come back to Clovis. You could just stop recording and go lay down, rest, whatever. Matter of fact, um, uh, there are one photo that I'm for sure of that I've seen uh, was taken a Buddy at the Norman Petty studio, and he was sitting on a couch with his head back trying to catch a few winks. So... <clears throat> So that that that's a pretty nice photo. But um, you know, yeah, that it, 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 you you do uh, during your book you do have uh, an interview uh, reprinted interview of uh, Norman. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there is information in there about how uh, you know, he he was uh, very encouraging for uh, Buddy to experiment. Well, I'll have to agree with you on that too. You know, uh, Norman wasn't set in stone. You know, uh, just like just like Buddy, if, if Buddy had an idea and he thought something would work, Norman would say, go ahead and try it. And if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, they would try something else. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, like on the recording Peggy Sue, uh, they were recording it and the drums were so loud that they couldn't get the right mix on the recording so they had to move the drums into another room. Uh, so uh, J.I. Allison could play the drums on the recording So, and for everything to come out fine. So, But they always made sure that no matter how long it took, they got the right sound. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, since, since we're talking about J.I. and his uh, drawing, it, there's also the, uh, what is it, like, uh, spanking his knees or thighs for every day. It was... Was that one of Norman's ideas, or uh, some? Was it done at his uh, studio? Yeah, I, well, I think, I think uh, yeah, it wasn't that actually. Uh, uh, I know Gary is going to correct me if I'm wrong here. Wasn't it uh, an ideal that then Buddy actually hear J.I. slapping his uh, hands against his Levi's and. Thought, the, thought that sound was, like, really kind of catchy and maybe appropriate, and they suggested that they kind of try a cut with that. Is that is that right, Gary? Or? Well, yep, that's 100% right. So, you know, Buddy was, all, you know, Buddy was always listening to things. So, you know, if he heard something, he thought, well, we'll try it. Like on the song Not Fade Away, you know, they used a cardboard box. Because um, um, Buddy at that point thought that that uh, excuse me that using the box would create a better sound than using the drum kit. So and as as you can tell, it that was a lot clearer sound. And uh, <coughs> there's a lot of musicians that have gone on to say that they said, you know what. J.I. Allison playing on that box was a sound that we were trying to get all along. So, you know, that, that, that's been, rep, you know, things like that, a little different nuances have been used on on different songs throughout history, so. Okay, and uh, Gary, you talk about the um, what's that xylophone type instruments on every day. So it's, it's called a Celeste. So uh, I know there's some people that have had have argued this uh, of who was playing the Celeste on every day, and I will tell you that I'm 99.999 percent sure that it was by Petty Norman Petty's wife. So. Um, Matter of fact, there's a, a DVD that's out, uh, the real Buddy Holly story, which was produced in Paul Mac- uh, produced by Paul McCartney, that has Vipe playing the Celeste. So, um, like I said, uh, when the the, the the movie that came out, the Buddy Holly story with Gary Busey. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm kind of maybe jumping a little bit ahead of myself here, so just tell me if I am. But uh, um, like I said, the uh, movie I was just talking about, the real Buddy Holly story that was produced by Paul McCartney, was uh, when the movie that had Gary Busey in it, the uh, the Buddy Holly story came out. You know, it was definitely um, a good movie, entertaining, filled with a lot of inaccuracies. And so... Uh, Paul McCartney decided that uh, he wanted to do to make a movie that would set the record straight. So, uh, the real Buddy Holly story is a, a documentary that's got uh, his brothers and J.I. Allison and Joe B. Malden and others that are talking about what it was like uh, growing up and getting into the music and Buddy's brothers talking about their relationship with Buddy. So. Uh, like I said, I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself at this point, but that's a real good movie. And uh, if I can uh, just echo what Gary said about the real Buddy Holly story and maybe put a sort of a personal spin on it, too, if I may. Uh, uh, the real Buddy Holly story was one of the very first things that really stoked you know, my passion for learning about uh the final that final period of Buddy's life, uh, January uh, and early February of '59. There's a segment towards the end of that doc where uh, 
uh, Tommy Alsup is being interviewed, and Tommy uh, played uh, for Buddy on the uh, Winter Dance Party tour. And I, I, as a as a young teenager, I studied that segment of film over and over again, like it was the Shroud of Turin or something. I I was I just you know the and there were some great photos that flashed uh, uh, throughout that little section uh, uh, that were taken uh, from the Green Bay, Wisconsin show on February the 1st of 59, taken by a photographer named Larry Maddy, uh, and beautiful color photos, probably the best of that tour. Uh, and anyways, uh, I was just, uh, that documentary really was instrumental and stoke in my passion for uh, Buddy Holly and specifically uh, the Winter Dance Party Tour. Well, I definitely have to agree with Ryan on that, too. You know, uh, when, when the movie first came out, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I remember renting it as a, uh, a uh, on VHS at Blockbuster, so... <laughs> and, 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 Shows you how long ago that was, but uh, uh, I, I finally did add it to my collection on DVD, and it is really a good movie. And if anybody wants to really learn more about Buddy, there are a lot of DVDs out there. But I, I, I do agree with Ryan. I would I would suggest trying to locate yourself a copy of the real Buddy Holly story because I think it's the best documentary out there. But then again, that's just me. So I fully endorse that view, Gary. Well, thank you. <laughs> Mutual admiration society. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it's you know when I listen to um the very best of Buddy Holly and the Crickets, um, it has you know like 50, about fifty songs on it. What um. It, it, yeah, you know, there's you know, the lyrics seem yeah you know, simplistic for the time. Yeah, you know, they're also yeah you know, being written by a what twenty twenty one year old. Um, but but there is still a maturity to the writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Ryan or Gary, do you, do you, do you hear that as well, or you know, do you have a different take on it? Um, my take is uh, no, you're absolutely you know it. I mean, Holly, uh, you know, he wrote for his audience, and his audience at that time, you know, I, he had a he had a good sense for kind of what was in the zeitgeist of of the you know of of teenage existence and that was usually you know going to parties uh getting grounded borrowing the car from mom and dad that sort of thing and he wrote to that but he always put his own little unique flair to that and with a lot of his earlier recordings especially it's really not so much about the words but it's kind of more for me at least personally uh about the fill-in that he puts behind those words. He's able to convey something that almost transcends, you know, some of the words that he wrote. Uh, uh, And I'll be doggone, I've not seen many uh, other artists, you know, before our sense that have been able to pull that, you know, little magic trick off. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, Just to kind of piggyback what Ryan was saying, you know, I, I don't know if I should mention by name, but I know there are uh, a couple of very famous musicians that have said, you know, that they liked listening to the lyrics of Buddy Holly songs because they were direct and to the point. They weren't complicated. You didn't have to figure what they were saying. You know, you knew what he was saying. But say it in two minutes or less. And um, as far as the actual playing of the music... Uh, there have been, I'm sure there's plenty of people uh, in the United States, but uh, during Buddy's UK tour, there were musicians that were that were don't, that have said, excuse me, that the songs 
didn't seem complicated to play. And just starting out as musicians at that point, they thought, well, this is probably something I could play. And so then, you know, they would sit down with their guitars and they would try to, you know, to play That'll Be the Day or Peggy Sue. And, you know, and they were able to do it. And um, the other thing about it is, you know, that Buddy, Buddy and the Crickets started something that the rest of rock and roll picked up on, whether consciously or unconsciously, you know, that there was four guys up on stage. They all wrote their own music. You know, they didn't have to worry about somebody from the outside saying, okay, here's a song, and go out and play it. They were writing their own songs, so they had their own little contained group. They had, they were writing their own songs. It was, it was perfect. And like I said, you know, going forward, you know, there's lots of groups that have copied that. You know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, which, by the way, um, <clears throat> when the Beatles started in their Quarrymen days, their first acetate was That'll Be the Day. And the Rolling Stones, their first big release was Not Fade Away. So, I mean, I think that's uh, a real tr- um, a real good tribute to uh, their love for Buddy Holly and the music that they that their first songs were Buddy Holly songs. So, <coughs> excuse me. You know, when when we've had you know get, Gary made some good points, and you know, when you know we've done uh, I know, maybe. Uh, I, uh, probably the best example is when um, you know, we were doing the uh, Shakespeare authorship controversy uh, last year, and uh, you know one of the books uh, 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 I read to uh, prep for the show was. Uh, Shakespeare identified and uh, the uh, J. Thomas Looney was talking about how uh, Shakespeare, if Shakespeare was uh, writing those really intricate sonnets at 34 it, at the age of 34 it really doesn't uh seem appropriate for someone his age to be writing on the maturity level of someone in his 50s and and once you reach you know, like that age that's where you, you know, you're uh, you've had enough life experiences and uh, immaturity to deal with situations uh you're not flying off the handle uh and but you know he was make uh looney was making the point that um you know a lot of younger people um just d- don't have the maturity to Write these worldwide ma- masterpieces, but it, you know there are exceptions, and, and it, it just seems uh, you know after reading you know G- Gary's book, and you know then I, I'm starting to listen more closely to uh, this uh, you know Buddy Holly CD. It is you know there's. Uh, you know, maybe Buddy is actually an exception to uh, that rule. <clears throat> well, I'm going to have to agree with you, and hopefully I'm not interrupting you when I say this, but I know um, uh, the very first time I ever went to the surf ballroom was in 2009, and there was a very famous playwright there, and I'm not going to mention his name because I don't <laughs> don't really want to do that on the podcast, but, uh, you know, I, he made the comment, he said, you know, just to think that Buddy wrote all those 
beautiful songs and died when he was 22, George Gershwin would have been proud. And that was one of those mind-blowing moments to actually compare Buddy Holly to George Gershwin. But, you know, uh, you know, look at all the masterpieces that uh, the Ger- Gershwin brothers recorded and, you know, how young they were. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you think back, you know, at a lot of the um, <clears throat> people that were really young and they either wrote songs or wrote books or whatever the case may be. And we lost them at a really early age, you know, and, uh, and I just find that mind boggling sometimes that, you know, that, that they were able to accomplish all they accomplished in a short period of time. And sometimes you look at some uh, people today and it'll take them an entire lifetime to accomplish what, they did maybe in two years or so. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'm falling into that category. Uh, takes a lifetime. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, it, uh, it, you know what we we've just been talking about is uh, uh, an in interest of mine is the, the creative process. It it really is interesting. I you know you get you know uh, what twelve years later, uh, Jim Morrison just ha- had almost uh, uh, and, and well, Jimi Hendrix would be uh, a contemporary where most of everything. We knew that it, it, those two recorded was just in a uh, about four year time period, right? Um, it, it, yeah, I, I I just find it really fast. Like it, you know, like what I was talking about with the maturity level of older people, but sometimes you get you know the few examples of younger people who really made a difference. Um, I, I, I just think a lot about that. Sure, and you know what's uh, what's fascinating is Buddy Holly's career when he passed away, still very embryonic. He was still developing. He was still growing as an artist, yeah. uh, and we know that just from some of the music he left behind that he recorded in his uh, apartment in New York City. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a great bluesy number he cut. Uh, uh, called That Makes It Tough. Oh, my golly. Uh, Gary can probably vouch for this. It's uh, it's just this wonderful piece of soul music from Buddy Holly. It's just uh, uh, startling. Uh, I, it's fascinating to think what he might have done with that practice tape when he had, if he had come back from that winter dance party tour. Well, I... I yeah, Gary, you, know, you mentioned the tape, uh, the uh, recordings he just did with his little tape recorder in his apartment in New York. You have a little section on that. Yeah, uh, like I said, it was it was, uh, I believe six songs that he had recorded on uh, the little reel to reel recorder he had in his house, and it, those, believe it or not, those are also on YouTube, and they've got. Uh, not only the songs, but, you know, Buddy and Maria talking and, you know, just a lot of uh, going back and trying the song again because Buddy might have hit the wrong string or the wrong chord and he maybe wanted to change it to a different chord or something. But, yeah, those are beautiful. And uh, it just got me to thinking that I believe there is a – And I keep talking about YouTube, but you can get this stuff on CD and stuff if you look hard enough. Um, Matter of fact, there's a a great site in the UK called Roller Coaster Records, and that's where you can find a lot of this, a lot of the rare stuff. But uh, um, it just got me to thinking that there was a uh, a group called the David Hansen Combo, and. they took uh, the song, some of the apartment songs from Buddy, and uh, you know they 
cleaned them up a little bit, and they added, uh, you know, s- some brand new orchestration and things to those recordings. And those, I mean, I, I like the stuff that Buddy recorded in New York without, you know, all the overdubbing and everything. But these recordings I'm talking about with the David Hanson combo, they're just they're beautiful. I mean, it's. You, you, uh, for what they tried to accomplish, they're beautiful. So, but it just shows you the scope of, you know, you can take a good song, and it's really difficult to make it bad. But I'm sure there's somebody out there that could do it. But, you know, these songs almost have like a life of their own. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It, it, it. Gary, you just mentioned the uh, string section. Um, you, know, you, you know, look at uh, you know, just for example, it doesn't matter anymore. I think that uh, has a uh, string sec- section. Was a uh, Norman uh, uh, suggesting something like you know? I want you have you know, like a, you know, the uh, string section for. You know, for this uh, track, uh, it, it, what, or is that uh, Buddy's original idea? So, well, like I said, uh, Ryan can come in on this one too. But in my in my honest opinion, that was all Buddy's idea. You know, Buddy loved okay. playing the Buddy loved playing the rock and roll because that's where the bread and butter was at. But uh, you know, Buddy wanted to get into playing. Uh, he really wanted to do do the strings. Um, so that was really his thing. He wanted to, uh, you know, to try it out and see what it would sound like. You know, and I got to thinking about this probably a couple of years ago. You know, uh, <clears throat> if Buddy would have never had the idea to do strings, you know, and those recordings came out beautiful, you know, the, at the pit, you know, that they recorded at the Pythian Temple. You know, just think of some of the groups we wouldn't have today. You wouldn't have ELO or you wouldn't have Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer or groups or groups like Yes, you know, some of the more progressive groups that were out there during the 70s, you know. So, yeah, kudos to Buddy on that. That's a good point. So, 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 so. Anyways, um, I was, was going to say something else. I can't think of what I was going to say. So, <laughs> I'll say this: um, uh, yeah. you mentioned it doesn't matter anymore, and there's two camps of Buddy Holly fans. There's the camp that just absolutely they're very, um, very fanatical about the rockabilly uh, uh, phase of Holly's career, and they're they're a little, maybe a little more weary about the the string stuff. You know, there's this perception that maybe Ollie was trying to <clears throat> uh, segue out of rock and roll. But <clears throat> you know, the older I get, the more I have to say I I become. <laughs> I think it doesn't matter anymore. It's probably my all time favorite Buddy Holly song. I'll probably be castigated and burned in effigy <laughs> for publicly saying that. And it's not even Buddy's song. I, it was written for him by uh, Mr. Paul Inka, who I, I believe. Uh, the, the two of them were about to engage in a, uh, a writing partnership uh, with one another after that uh, Winter wow. Games Party tour. So, yeah, no, um, yeah, the string stuff, uh, as I get older, I don't know, maybe my tastes are changing. I don't know what's happening, but <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big uh, aficionado of that stuff. I wish uh, maybe some outtakes or uh, stuff like that might pop up one day. Uh, although, from what I understand, Buddy nailed it doesn't matter anymore, I think, in one take. So <laughs> that rules out that. Yeah. And kind of piggybacking on what uh, Ryan was saying just a few minutes ago, during those sessions at Pythian Temple, you know, they had a set list of the songs that they were going to perform there. And uh, <clears throat> and the song, It Doesn't Matter Anymore, that they didn't think they could work it in. You know, so um, Buddy got with Dick Jacobs, and, you know, he told Dick Jacobs, he said, I have to do this song. I just have to do this song. We have to work it into the section. And they did work it into the section. And, you know, so uh, with with the help of uh, Dick, Dick Jacobs' arrangements and things, and 
And like Ryan just said, you know, we nailed it in one take. And if you do listen to that song, uh, no, I, I, I'm not trying to compare it to any other song, but as far as a song that's out there that is as timeless as it doesn't matter anymore, this might sound weird, but I put it right up there with Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Because Perfect. You know, those, 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 two, those two songs, for some reason, seem to go, in a weird way, seem to go so well together, and they're both timeless, and they're never they're never going anywhere. They're here forever. Very true. And uh, a little <laughs> trivial pursuit moment here. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, posthumously peaked for Holly at number thirteen, and it was uh, he was he was promoting it uh, while he was on the uh, Winter Dance Party Tour. Uh, I've always maintained if Holly had lived, that song would have been a, a, a number one hit. I just, uh, I, I really feel, the guy at the studio, I just feel like the his label didn't really know how to push the song. They kind of floundered after his passing. And uh, But yeah, it's just, again, I, I love that song so much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it, it is a very uh, a moving song. Uh, so, you know, we ha- have uh, have to get to um, Buddy and, and the Crickets um, appearance on the Ed Sullivan show and the importance of the uh, you know tour of the UK and you know, hope, you know we have a lot of UK listeners uh I I'm sure that they, they will you know find find this part uh interesting uh you know, G- Gary do you want to talk about one or the other uh, whichever one, uh, well, I guess I could talk about the UK tour. Uh, okay. You know. Uh, the Trocadero. Yeah. So so what happened in the UK was that they went gone on a, uh, um, it, uh, it was a show that was hosted by Des O'Connor, and it was like a variety show. It had the, the Tanner sisters and uh, a few other acts, and Buddy Holly and the Crickets was the rock and roll act. It was there for the kids. But, um, like I said, it was a variety show, and everybody went out and did their, um, like, the two or three songs or whatever, and then the next act came out. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, um, there's also, speaking of the UK tour, and once again, I'm going to go back to, to uh, the YouTube uh, thing. There is a, uh, a great show that's hosted by Jeff Barker uh, that's called Buddy in Britain, and that's just got some incredible um, interviews with, with people that, um, <clears throat> that were either in the audience of of the UK tours or they were actually uh, uh, with the tour with Des O'Connor. So um, uh, that's about all I had at this point. <laughs> I'll throw in another book suggestion. Uh, there's a great book on <clears throat> by a fellow named Jim Carr who used to run a Holly fanzine called, appropriately enough, uh, Holly International. Uh, he wrote a great book uh, about Buddy's UK tour also. Uh, it's about as rare as hen's teeth, so uh, you'll have to really scour uh, eBay on a regular basis to find it, but it's, uh, it's, it's well worth your time tracking down if you want to know more about that uh, UK tour. Right. And there's also a couple of books uh, by another UK author, Spencer Lay, uh, that's also right. that's also so uh, that talks about Buddy and the UK tour and you know and those are both good books to try to see if you can find too. By like I said, the author again, his name is Spencer Lay, L E I G H. So okay, so I know the um, it might have been I know it's definitely the second time I saw Albert Lee playing. He, he's talking about. Uh, he, he wanted to uh, go to you know, the Trocadero 
in March of 1958, and he he was there on the wrong day, and uh, <laughs> but it, yeah, you know, fit, what 15 about 15 years later, he he's en- ends up working with the crickets for a couple years, but um, yeah, he uh, Al- Albert still plays uh, songs. Um, and some of his uh, favorite buddy songs, like uh, uh, "Rock Around with Ollie V," are still, um, you know, classic uh, rockabilly song. But um, it, it seems like there must have been a lot of British kids who really um, got a great taste of American music on that tour. Uh, uh, What was the impact of uh, like the three weeks that they spent in England and the uh, TV appearances? Well, uh, the one thing about the uh, uh, appearing live in TV appearances is that, you know, they were always on the go. There wasn't much time for, you know, just a whole lot of leisure. Uh, Sightseeing. You know, and- so, uh, sightseeing and that kind of thing. So, you know, they might be on a television program and then they're off to do a show and then they're after they leave that show, they're on their way to another show. So, uh, you know, I was going to say the influence on a lot of the British musicians, like I said, once again, I'm not going to mention any person's name or, uh, on the podcast, but there's one one very famous uh, musician that said, you know, that seeing Buddy Holly and the Crickets, you know, all they did is that they took the sound they were hearing repackaged it into their own songs and gave it back to us via the British invasion. So, uh, well said. And, and, and uh, there, like I said, there's also another very famous British musician who said, you know, that he was very surprised by the sound that was coming out of this small little amp and Buddy's guitar and uh, you know they were they were just blown away at what Buddy was able to do the sound he was able to uh, to make to come out of this small little you know they carried on this speaker onto the stage and uh, you know and then prior to that they might have had uh, an orchestra playing and Buddy and uh, the Crickets were able to somehow match that sound level. So, and then, like I said, there was a lot of the younger people in the audience that were surprised that that they were able to to uh, that Buddy and the Crickets were able to reach that level of sound with just those with just that small little speaker and his guitar. Okay. It- and what um what six five, five years or so before you know, the uh Beatles uh made their appearance on Ed Sullivan um uh, Buddy Holly and the Crickets were on the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, what do you think of that performance and what were, uh, what's some of your research into that uh, prestigious show uh, revealed to you about the uh, ha- having a prime time exposure? Um, you know, that Sullivan show in the 1950s was the Cadillac of uh, variety shows. Uh, if you're a, an up-and-coming rock and roll act, you can't beat the uh, 
the free publicity uh, a spot on the Sullivan Show gets you. And uh, Holly and the Crickets appeared on the Sullivan Show twice, uh, once in uh, late 57, second time in early 58. Uh, the first time, you know, uh, went off you know, pretty well. They uh, performed uh, Peggy Sue and That'll Be the Day, uh, both of them which were really high in the charts for them at the time. And uh, uh, it's interesting, by the time Holly and the boys appeared on the Sullivan Show in early 58, if you go back, and again, to echo Gary with, uh, go to YouTube, the, the, the Sullivan clips with Holly, uh, are, I'm sure, are probably plastered all over that site. But uh, the, the difference in stage appearance uh, for Holly, Allison, Malden, and Sullivan although Sullivan was gone by the time of the second appearance, the stage appearance uh, of those group of boys from the first show to the second is markedly different. They had gone Ivy League by the second appearance and uh, looked very polished. They were hanging out with the Everly Brothers by that point, and uh, I think they were all hanging out down in the village uh, at, uh, you know, at the uh, clothing shops and spending a lot of money like you know any kid would do in New York City at that time. But uh, the second appearance uh, was a little uh, shakier for the crickets than the first. Uh, there was a problem with the timing of uh, uh, the crickets showing up. Uh, apparently, Sullivan was ready to cue uh, the crickets at one point, and Holly was there, and uh, J.I. and Joe B. were nowhere to be found. And uh, by, by the time they corralled them, uh, I, uh, you know, word round campfire is that Holly had kind of rubbed Sullivan the wrong way. And you look at that clip of that uh, second appearance, Holly's performing Oh Boy. Uh, and the lighting is just a little shadier than that first appearance. Uh, the camera seems a little shakier. It, it doesn't see, it seems deliberately, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say it was, you know, deliberate sabotage, but you kind of wonder. And anyways, uh, and I've, I've never been able to determine if it's urban legend or fact, but uh, I believe Terry Allison actually said that Holly was approached uh, to appear on Sullivan a third time in late mm-hmm. 58. And I think by that point, Holly had just kind of had his, uh, had his fill of Ed Sullivan, at least for that period of time, and actually turned, apparently turned down an appearance. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of a buddy... But he's a tumultuous history with Mr. Ed Sullivan. And once again, to kind of piggyback what Ryan was saying that second time around, you know, that uh, um, uh, that Buddy and J.I. and Joe B., uh, I guess I miffed Ed Sullivan off because, you know, uh, J.I. and Joe B. were nowhere to be found, that when it came time for them to go on the stage, uh, Ed Sullivan introduced them as Buddy Hollard and his mm-hmm. cricket. So it wasn't Buddy <laughs> Hollard and the crickets. He said Buddy Hollard and his crick cuts. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you can. Uh, and what have you heard, Gary? About uh, from what I understand, originally uh, the crickets were supposed to perform two songs uh, on that second appearance, and. Uh, I guess uh, because of the uh, the tardiness of the crickets, uh, it got struck down to one. Do, uh, do you know anything about that? Or well, yeah, it, it did get struck down to one, and it was all just a timing issue. And actually, um, uh, Ed was trying to uh, cut the first song a little bit short, so Buddy made sure that he just played the whole thing a little bit faster. <laughs> And if you look at the clips on YouTube, you can see him, his, his hand is moving like a lightning bolt. Uh, <laughs> He's just, really working it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just, just to finish the song. but And then he lets out, which, you know, he I, 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 this is just my speculation. So, you know, uh, Buddy let out a howl when he, when he was, uh, when he, speeding up playing the guitar trying to get the rest of the song finished so I'm sure that probably didn't make that happy either but 
Okay. Well, um, well, once, once again, if anybody wants to see, like I said, either the first appearance or the second appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, they are there on YouTube. Yeah, it, it's really surprising uh, about the number of, um, you know, the, the related videos on YouTube and, uh, you know, the the number of uh, young people interested in the topic as well, uh, I thought it was uh, surprising, you know, uh, you know, refreshing as well. Well, like I said, you know, I said earlier that, you know, uh, good songs just remain timeless. It doesn't matter whether they came out in 1959 or 2009, if it's a good song, it's it's going to stand the test of time. So you know, and, and kind of speaking of that uh, a little bit, uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, not a Buddy Holly song, but uh, a, a song that has stood the test of time, uh, uh, "American Pie" by Don McLean. So, uh, and <clears throat> I was actually talking to Ryan about this uh, um, last week, I think. But on Paramount Plus, there is a uh, a documentary about American Pie and its legacy of the and its legacy that it's lasted 50 years. So that's something else that the listeners are interested in. That they may want to check that out. But it's a real good song because um, Don McLean explains the lyrics in the song and things that people thought all along was not correct. It's not what he was trying to convey. So there's a, it's actually a good documentary and it it clears up a lot of things that people may have thought over the years that were either incorrect or not 100% correct. Okay. And, and, you know, I I still want to leave some time for, uh, you know, Rod Sterling. Uh, so you know, uh, I think we've had su- such a, a terrific discussion. Um, you know, we don't need to get into you know, the very end, but uh, it, you know, uh, uh, both of you have mentioned going to the uh, surf ballroom, and and mm-hmm. that's uh, you know, from one of the videos I saw. Uh, that looks like uh, just a, uh, a, a you know, beautiful uh, museum. Uh, you know the uh, dance floor and you know, state. Uh, it's they've done a, a remarkable job of uh, maintaining the uh, sacredness. Of, of that uh, destination as a museum? Absolutely. And to to quote uh, the late Bill Griggs, uh, the surf ballroom is a time machine. You step through those doors and you are transported back to a, a very a very close approximation of what it must have been like in 1959, you know, going to see the Winter Dance Party Tour there on February the 2nd uh, of 59. It's, it, it's truly a remarkable, and as you said, it's, uh, it's almost spot on uh, to what it looked like in 59. I think the only difference is they've, uh, they've widened the stage out a little bit, um, so it's not the, the stage isn't the same size, but they do have the original um, uh, diameters of the stage kind of uh, taped off, so you can kind of get a, a sense when you're in there about the, the size of the original stage. <clears throat> also, too, if you do have an opportunity to walk in there, like I said, it's, uh, you know, there's pictures on the wall, signed photographs of everybody that's played there, you know, from the big band days of the 30s all the way up to the present time. So, and, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a nice, a nice venue, so you can kind of get an idea uh, of, of what it might have felt like on February second, nineteen fifty nine. So, 
And let me tell you, Mark, I've been to some of the other uh, surviving ballrooms and theaters and armories mm -hmm. that uh, hosted the Winter Dance Party in 59, and none of them, I mean, none of them look uh, as well-maintained as a surf ballroom. They've done a remarkable job. They truly have. Yeah, I, I was... Uh, I thought it was a marvel uh, when I... I was watching one of the videos last night. I, so the uh, you know the people took you know their camera all through it, and I like uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, the next time, you know, the first time I'll uh, be in Iowa, but uh, I would definitely put that on the top of my list to to go there. I, I, I was just. Uh, very, very impressed with the quality of uh, 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 maintaining the atmosphere there. It, it looks like just a wonderful place to visit. But yeah, it, it, it really is. It's holy ground for rock and roll fans. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, 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 I'd like, I'd, I'd like to go there at some point. It, so you know, we. Um, you know, Ron. You know, we're talking about you know doing a show later. Uh, you know, focuses on y your uh, books on the winter dance party and uh, in Flanders Field. Um, you, you know, uh, we can come back to uh, that on on another date. Uh, you know, I just want to keep keep things um, moving ahead with you know, just uh, so many positive uh, uh, topics. But um, so, at, you know, Gary, uh, a lot of your, you know, the cricket six decades of rock and roll memories, um, you know, Jerry Allison and, Waylon Jennings, all, you know, all, all these people, uh, you know, Al, Albert Lee, all all these people that you know we've mentioned um, had a very lengthy career. They persevered after uh, you know traumatic event that uh, probably would have uh, caused everyone just to. Uh, split up. Uh, G Gary, what was? H how did you know, uh, the, the the rest of the band stay together for that many years and you know really co contribute a lot of uh, material to? Uh, pop culture. I did not realize that uh, Sonny Curtis wrote the uh, Mary Tyler Moore theme song. Oh. Yeah, yes, he did. And uh, and actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sonny Curtis has won so many awards for his songwriting, but, you know, he was also responsible for writing uh, the song I Fought the Law. Yep. And, which was a big Bobby Fuller song, Bobby Fuller 4, and of, co of course more than I could say, which has been covered by everybody from Bobby V to Leo Sayre. So, um, you know, a af after Buddy died, you know, the band was without their leader. They weren't quite for sure what they were going to do. They, they knew they loved music. They wanted a career in music, I would think, but they didn't know what to do because Buddy wasn't there. So, um, you know, uh, at, at, like I said, at one point, you know, prior to Buddy's death, you know, um, they had kind of gone their separate ways for a little bit. But uh, supposedly Jerry Allison was trying to get a hold of Buddy uh, at, at the surf ballroom 
um, he didn't have any luck because he had finally decided that they wanted to, that that him and Joe B wanted to get back together with him because at one point Norman convinced him. He said, you know, buddy's going to New York. I, don't go to New York with him. Just stay here, and you know, we'll we'll figure something out. You don't want to get involved in New York because a lot of things going on there, and you know. So at that point, um, um, Ji and Joe B. You know, they kind of uh, they stayed back in Lubbock, and uh, we went to New York, and basically, uh, uh, Ji and Joe B. said they got tired of not really doing anything, so they wanted to do something. They wanted to get back into doing their music, so, uh, you know, J.I. wanted to get back, call Buddy and say, hey, we're ready to get back together, but that last night they couldn't connect, and, you know, that the rest is history. Okay, it, 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 what was, you know, they did not rest on their uh, laurels. They just continued to be very productive um, people, musicians. Well, right, right. Well, like I said, you know, uh, you know, after Buddy had passed away and they decided to get back into the music business, you know, there was... You know, there was a whole host of changes. They needed to have a lead singer. Mm-hmm. Wasn't quite for sure. Who, wasn't quite for sure who to get. And then there was this young man named Earl Sinks, great vocalist, great vocalist. And um, you know, then as things progressed, uh, you know, Earl Sinks had left the band and was replaced by Jerry Naylor. And um, you know, they they went through that phase in the '60s of you know becoming you know uh, at one point almost like a pop group. You know, they covered a lot of Beatles songs, which every group at that point, if you if you were anybody, you were covering. I want to hold your hand, and she loves you, and please please me. I can't. Like I said, I've been a record collector since I was 12 years old, and I can't think of almost any album that I ever bought. From Johnny Rivers to uh, Bobby V to Gary Lewis and the Playboys, everybody covered a Beatles song. Excuse me, even Jan and Dean, they covered two or three Beatles songs that I'm thinking about right now at the moment. But, uh, you know, and then, um, then as things progressed into the 70s, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, they did some session work. Uh, J.I., like I said, not only did work for Eric Clapton, he also did some work on some of the uh, later LPs for Johnny Rivers. And uh, like I said, there was a, a whole host of members that kind of changed in the 70s. And uh, uh, members would leave the group for one reason or another. There were several members at one point that had passed away, you know, so everything was evolving, you know, not just the group itself, but the music and people's musical taste was changing. So, you know, the crickets were just like everybody else trying to adapt to the changing landscape, excuse me, the ever changing landscape of music. So. Okay. And uh, Gary, you got to uh, meet uh, the crickets on about their last ever concert. Right. Uh, the well, the last ever uh, out of the last three concerts, I was able to attend two of them. Uh, the first one I was able to attend was in 2012, and I didn't attend the second one, which was in Pennsylvania, and I live in Indiana, so. I mean, I probably could have gone, but uh, I was unable to go. So then the last one I went to was uh, 
the, uh, at the Winter Dance Party in 2017. So uh, uh, it, what it was was um, in tribute to uh, Joe B. Malden, who had passed away, um, and uh, it was J.I. Allison, and it was Sonny Curtis, and Albert Lee, and uh, Keith Allison, and and uh, <clears throat> Glenn D. Hardin, Gordon D. Payne, <clears throat> excuse me, and a gentleman by the name of Tony O'Kay, which you might want to do some research on that name, but uh, he also performed on a, a great CD that's uh, yeah, kind of difficult to find. You can still find it, though. It's called Crickets and Their Buddies. So uh, um, he was there. And that was pretty much, that was it for the crickets. They hung everything up, and to the best of my knowledge, they have retired, and they're okay. enjoying the rest of their lives. Well, uh, that must have been a great opportunity uh, for for you to highlight of your life, life to meet them. Uh, it, it was it was great. I actually, um, uh, you know, I was all, almost starstruck meeting them. But you know, there anybody will tell you that if you've ever met J.I. or excuse me, when Joby was alive and Sonny Curtis, you know, they're just down to earth. You know, uh, they're just great guys. Sit there, have a conversation with them, drink a beer. You know, that's it, it, it's nice when you get to meet your rock and roll heroes and they're everything you thought they were going to be. So, yeah, I was definitely very excited and very happy that I had that opportunity in my life. Oh, good good for you. Okay, let's, you know, since, since we have uh, only about 30 minutes left, um, uh now let's switch topics over to the upcoming uh, Serling Fest in Binghamton, New York, and it, Gary, you're working on a book on uh, a lot of the spirituality that uh, w- was conveyed in the uh, Twilight Zone. Yeah. Uh, episodes. Well, yeah, uh, what's your working title? You hope to well, have that out soon. Well, yeah, the working title at this point is God, Death, Heaven, and Hell in the Twilight Zone. And it's more or less just an examination of, uh, I'd like to say a handful of episodes, but I think I've probably got it down to maybe about 40, 45 episodes. And... Uh, it's just the examination of the content of the episodes and uh, the spirituality and uh, just that kind of thing. So, uh, um, you know, the, the one thing I loved about about uh, Rod Surly and The Twilight Zone, which, of course, Rod wasn't the only writer, but, um, you know, the one the one message I liked about that show was that there was always um, seemingly like to, a- to answer to a higher power or to a higher calling or something like that. So one thing I loved about Rod's writing, which not only went into the Twilight Zone but into into uh, a show later, uh, Night Gallery, is that the good guys usually seem to come out on top and the bad guys usually seem to have a come up, and so um, and that, that's kind of where I'm heading at with with the book. Okay. Um. And, and like I said, the other thing I think I might add with that is that just I'm 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 also uh, adding some like odd little facts here and there that people might find mm-hmm. interesting. Without giving too much of the book away, uh, uh, there's an episode called "To Serve Man," and okay. it's, that's one and of the best about, ones. Right, it's about the um, aliens, the Canimates, 
But one thing I didn't know until I started doing the research is that cannabis is a real word. And uh, it, it, it comes from a, a different dialect. And what's really uh, interesting is in this different dialect, the word cannabis means tasty, which if anybody has seen the episode of Serve Man, is very interesting. And then one other thing, and then like I said, I won't get give too much more of the book away, is that there is another episode called Time Enough at Last, where Burgess mm-hmm. Meredith plays Henry Bemis. And mm-hmm. at the end of the episode, at the end of the episode, in part of Rod Serling's closing dialogue, he mentions of mice and men and Henry Bemis. Well, in 1939, Burgess Meredith starred in the movie of Mice and Men. So, just just a nice little fact there. Okay. Uh, just well, I think that's uh, what we've been doing tonight is tying together a lot of uh, loose awesome. ends. Awesome. And one of my uh, buddies. And uh, occasional co-host, um, who is li- listening in from Texas, uh, yeah, has said she has learned a lot tonight. She, so th- thank you, Ramona, R- Ramona, for listening. But um, yeah, yes, so, thank you very much. <laughs> um. But, you know, Ryan, have you noticed, you know, with all of your interest in um, the Twilight Zone and uh, Rod Serling, have uh, you seen some kind of, like, you know, that one incident that sparked... Buddy for Rod to become the person that they are known for. It, 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 you know, that, that's you know, kind of you know, one of my interests in tonight's topic is that cre- what creates that uh, the creative spark that is inspiring us uh, over sixty years later. Right. You know, I mean, Serlin uh, obviously had an affinity for, I think, for the underdog. Uh, This is evident in so much of his writing, uh, and beautifully so. Um, If if, if ever there was a champion for the the, uh, everyman, it would definitely be Serlin. I think you could maybe kind of make that through line with Holly also. He was sort of the champion for... You know, the everyday teenager. You know, sort of their captain, if you will. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> that's appropriate. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 I, it, it, again, that may be that may be a little too tenuous for some, but uh, I mean, I, I can certainly see uh, see that sort of you know that line, that solid line between the two. Well, like I said, I have to agree with Ryan too because I think, like with Buddy, you know, I think another connective thing with Buddy and Rod is that they both had these feelings inside of them, and they had to get them out. I think Buddy's feelings were, you know, uh, being this young kid, growing up, you know, starting to become an adult, you know, finally getting, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, going out on dates and falling in love and that kind of thing, and Buddy used his music to get that out. Now, like where Rod is concerned, uh, you know, uh, everything that I've ever heard is that Rod really got into the writing aspect of things because of his experiences in the war. So, I mean, you know, just like a lot of people had all these emotions and thoughts and things inside of him, and the only way he could get it out was by writing it down. And, you know, that's how we got some of the great episodes like uh, um, Quality of Mercy and Purple Testament and uh, King Nine Will Not, excuse me, King Nine Will Return. You know, it's just uh, 
you know, of course, not all the episodes of the Twilight Zone were about, you know, conflict or war or like that. But they were all, a lot of them were morality tales, you know. Um, yeah, they were. You know, where, 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 where you wanted the good guy to win and you wanted the bad guy to lose, you know. Mm. So and, and I also see uh, a real... Uh, connection between Serlin and Martin Sloan in walking distance. You know, I know uh, sort of like, you know, his fictitious time traveler in that uh, season one classic, Serlin, uh, I, I know, would oftentimes return to Binghamton to walk the streets of his youth and uh, kind of reflect, if you will. Um, so uh, there's uh, you know, they're Rod Serling and the Twilight Zone are one and the same. I, if you, if you yeah. ask me now why none of the uh, various uh, remakes over the years have really resounded, it's because uh, Zone was such a, a had such a personal voice, it had Serling's fingerprints all over it. You can separate one from the other, uh, and that's the brilliance of Rod Serling. You know, like I was talking about a few a few minutes ago. You know. Uh, you, I'm just giving you my feelings on this. You were talking about the, the uh, episode Walking Distance. Now, when uh, Serling was in the military, you know, his father had passed away. Right. And he, would, and he was not able to come home for the funeral. So uh, when Serling wrote Walking Distance, this, once again, this is just my own personal opinion, it was kind of a way to get those emotions and those feelings out, you know, to have, right. to have that last confrontation with your dad, to tell your dad something's not right, and looking for your dad's advice for something, you know. Um, um, you know, like I said, there, 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 there's a great scene in Walking Distance where um, Martin Stone is talking to his father, and uh, Martin says, you know, that he wanted to go back to this simpler time. He didn't want to go live in the he, – he didn't want to live in the present. He just wanted to live in the past. And his father told him, well, you know what? The problem is, is you're looking in the past. Try looking ahead. You know, and if you think about that statement, that's very profound. Because how many times do a lot of us live in the past? We don't think about the future and – the past is gone, and all we have is the future. So, like I said, that was a very profound statement in that episode. So, yeah. Well, and uh, Gary, that r- reminds me of uh, changing of the guard that aired last night on uh, Me TV and. I I I I'm you know, dealing more with the afterlife than directly you know god or the devil uh but um it it is looking at good deeds and moving uh forward in your life and when you get, you know, just you encounter uh, different stages. And uh, Professor Ellis uh, had had a lot of difficulty accepting, um, you know, the retirement, uh, you know, forced retirement stage. But uh, he 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 really was, you know, uh, looking backwards to move forward. Right. Well, you know, like uh, I just got to thinking about, like, in that particular episode, you know, um, because after so many years he was being forced to retire, he kind of took it upon himself that uh, that the years, all the years he had teach, that he had been teaching was wasted, which it wasn't, because uh, also in that episode is... Um, you know, the students that are approaching him, telling him, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have learned this. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have learned that, which I think is kind of interesting because I, 
I, I know it's a Christmas time movie, but I was watching uh, It's a Wonderful Life the other day, and it kind of reminded me of the scene where Jimmy Stewart is telling Clarence, he says, you know, when a man is gone, it leaves a horrible hole because each man touches another person's life, whether you want to believe it or not, which was, you know, kind of comparing that movie to the uh, Changing of the Guard episode that, uh, you know, Professor Fowler didn't think he had changed people's lives, but he did. You know, it's just that sometimes we don't we don't look and see, you know, all the positive things we've done in our lives, you know, that have caused positive changes in other people's lives. So, yeah, uh, 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 Ryan, what what drew you into becoming a Twilight Zone aficionado? Uh, well, you know, I, God, if I memory serves, I think I was like uh, eight years old when I saw my first episode of the Twilight Zone, and it was out of uh, WGN from Chicago, and uh, it was the uh, season one, The Hitchhiker, and I was really on a uh, I was like a true monster kid when I was growing up, in, in a good sense, where you know I uh, I loved you know the old Universal monster movies and fifties yeah. sci-fi and stuff like that, and so Twilight Zone just was right up my alley, and so I enjoyed it on a superficial level, really at first, you know, and as I got older uh, and sort of became more savvy to to what was going on in the world of film, I realized, you know, and I think other people have pointed this out, you know, what Serlin was doing with the Twilight Zone were these kind of little mini film noirs, you know, the the use of shadow uh, and the uh, cinematography, uh, it's so beautiful and never to be topped. I, I've never seen anything so beautiful uh, before or since. Uh, so uh, as I got older, you know, I appreciated it on different levels, but just certainly uh, Serlin's ability to get in there, uh, tell a really uh, crackling story in like 25, 26 minutes, uh, and just really knock our socks off. And I, you know, even the even the worst episode of The Twilight Zone is better than uh, probably about 100% of <laughs> the best shows that are out there right now. You know, uh, I, it's, again, uh, as Gary said, uh, Twilight Zone and Serlin, they're just evergreens. They really are. Yeah, it, 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 Gary, w- w- when, when you're writing about uh, um, you know, the spirituality of all all the episodes, uh, you, you have to have uh, something in there about uh, the Howling Man or the the, the one with oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. S- yeah. S- Sebastian Cabot. It, yeah, and that, most, most certainly. And l- like I said, there are um, there's there's one there's one section in there that just deals with what you were just talking about now. Um, you, you know, there is uh, an excellent episode also called Escape Clause. Oh, it, yeah. Okay. Which is which is uh, a, a guy that decides that he's going to sell his soul for immortality and I'm not going to I'm not going to spoil the ending but it, uh, it's one of those stories that be careful what you wish for it might come true um, and then of course there's another excellent episode with the devil uh, not just the howling man but another excellent episode uh, by the talented Burgess Meredith called Printer's Devil uh yeah, and uh, there is another great episode that has Julie Newmar, and uh, it was it, uh, it, from a story called uh, As of Late, I think, of Cliffordville, which was based on another short story, was based on a short story by, uh, boy, I can't even, I can't even think of his name right now. Um, I'm having one of those moments. The but, Jack uh, Finney, or... Uh, no, 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 Albert Salmi. Albert Salmi and Julie Newmar. Oh, right, 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 right. And, uh, he, uh, uh, Albert Salmi plays this guy who uh, is a really rich businessman 
but he longs to get, he longs to go back and uh, and uh, he's acquired everything that he could acquire, but he's he's willing to trade it all to go back and start at the very beginning. But uh, like I said, without giving away the episode, that's another great one to check out. Um, of late, I think of Cliffordville. As of as of late, I think of Cliffordville. So, uh, like I said, I could uh, expound upon that episode a little bit more, but you know, it's uh, you get a little bit older, and your memory's not what you think it was, and you wish to go back and do something that you did before, but you've forgotten about what things were really like, and you don't necessarily get the, the result that you're looking for. If anything, you get the exact opposite result. Yeah, uh, um, I, I, I don't feel badly about that. I, I, I forgot the title, too. That, uh, that's, uh, thanks, Nick, uh, for your great uh, Rod Serling biography. I, I had it say. Sit, sitting uh, here next to me, just, uh, just in case. Uh, yeah, I, that's a, that's I, I needed a prompt. So, so, uh, uh, yeah, we we have a few uh, episodes as well where, um, you know, the, uh, Rod and. Richard Matheson, the, the, the you know, cr- crew of uh, very talented writers, uh, also created uh, an a- afterlife. Uh, the hunt, uh, the the, the uh, 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 pool game with um, Jack Klugman. I just cl- set the book down, and yeah, I just for, I forgot that uh, episode. But you know, what are um, so, how, how does Rod portray some of these um, afterlife type episodes? Uh, what can we conclude from them? Well, you. you you know, I I think if you were to ask a lot of people, you know, if you say, what's the first thing you think of when you think of heaven? They'll say, well, sitting on a cloud all day and playing on a harp. Or you ask them, well, what about hell? Well, hell is uh, wearing this red suit and carrying a pitchfork and there's flames all around you. But, in you know, in the Twilight Zone and in, you know, uh, a couple of odd stories, you, 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 you know, um, hell could be something that we could create. You know, it may not be, it may not be a physical place, more as a more, excuse me, more of a place or something that you create. You know, I just was thinking of a great Rod Serling quote that says, you know, that man was put on this earth. Uh, to live once um, I know this isn't the exact quote but he says it's the prerogative of each man and woman or woman to create their own heaven or create their own hell which there's a lot of truth in that you know like I said without giving any uh, spoilers away you know there's a great that great episode with Sebastian Cabot a nice place to visit you know, usually I'm the first person to say that I saw the ending coming. Uh, I didn't see the ending coming on that one, but it was that was a, a real great ending. Um, uh, for one of your listeners that have not seen that episode, uh, the one with uh, Julie Newmar, I kind of thought it was going to end uh, the way it did, and it did. So, but. But but they're all great episodes. It's, but basically, um, the the episodes about hell is something that we personally create, you know, by our actions or inaction or something like that. So. 
Okay. Uh, um, yeah, we're. Yeah, we have about ten minutes left. Um, Ryan, what are you working on now? Mm, well, I'm uh, kind of just more of a hobbyist now, I guess you'd say, when uh, when it comes to to Buddy Holly uh, and the winter dance party. I I still kind of keep tabs on the whole thing, but uh, uh, right now I'm actually uh, deep in the process of writing a uh, new book. Uh, it's called the The Fight for Dog Fight. Uh, River Phoenix, Lily Teller, Seattle, and the Making of an American Classic. Uh, it's a little uh, making of book uh, of a great little film that came out in uh, 1990 called Dogfight, uh, which starred River Phoenix, the late actor. And so I've been uh, uh, deeply admired in that for the last several years, uh, kind of doing what I did with uh, Buddy Holly uh, in the Winter Dance Party, which is just going around and uh, interviewing as many of the uh, cast and crew uh, and people who were living in Seattle where Dogfight was shot at the time and who may have memories of um, seeing the movie uh, being shot in their uh, their uh, area of town. So that, that's that's what I've been uh, kind of, yeah, losing myself in lately. Okay. And, and you know, for your in, in Flanders field, uh yeah, you interviewed, or, or and your uh, uh, whole tr- uh, trilogy on the uh, Winter Dance Party. Uh, yeah, you've I- I- interviewed hundreds, you know, literally hundreds of uh, uh, pe- people to uh, put your publications together. Uh, I was very, I was very blessed. Uh... To talk to everyone that I talked to, and a lot of uh, you know, a lot of those people that I interviewed some time back, uh, you know, uh, they're no longer with us. Uh, so I feel very blessed and privileged to have recorded as many stories. I think I sort of compared it uh, at one point to sort of a, a race against time. You know, when I started these books, uh, I was kind of very wet behind the ears. I didn't really know what I was going to write about, and I just, but I knew that. Uh, history is kind of made up of our collective thoughts and memories, and I knew that every day these people were dying off, and so many people that I didn't get a chance to interview because I started my book so late in the game, which I kick myself for now. Uh, but yeah, I was very blessed to, you know, uh, speak to so many of the uh, former teenagers who attended those shows back in '59, and. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, I guess the so-called insiders uh, who, you know, whether they be like ballroom owners or uh, people who worked at airports or, or what have you. I was very fortunate to, and a, a lot of luck and, you know, a lot of help from a lot of different people. I, I, these, these books didn't, I wish I could say I did it all myself, and I certainly did not. Uh, just so many people who allowed me their time and so many people who, Helped me out along the way. I have so many names, <laughs> and Gary's one of them. And uh, well, yeah, I was just very blessed to have done what I did. Well, and, and just to, once again to piggyback on something Ryan said, and I've told him this a million times: is not only are those books they're historical documents, and those are very important because you know it, it definitely paints a picture of an you know gives us a more complete picture of an era that's gone, and you know, kind of like Ryan was saying, you know, once those people are gone, their stories are gone with them, so, you know, I really feel blessed that he was able to get those interviews with those people to actually document them and then get them out in book format to people, uh, you know, so that there will be future generations, you know, long after we're gone, that'll be able to pick up those books and say, hey, what happened in uh, Green Bay, you know, and uh, <laughs> thanks to Ryan's books, so they'll be able to do that. Well, and uh, if I could just give a little shout out real fast, I, none of those books would have ever have happened, for better or for worse, uh, for what they are. Uh, none of those books would have happened if it weren't for the uh, very kind help of a gentleman named Bill Griggs, uh, who used to run the uh, Buddy Holly Memorial Society here in the States, and uh, a real, a real mensch and a real welcoming uh, force to uh, newcomers in the Buddy Holly community. Very, very missed uh, now more than ever. Uh, uh, he just, 
he bent over backwards and he just really helped me out. Uh, he, he, he really inspired me and he got me off my keister and got me to, you know, uh, write these books. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, I just, uh, a very, very nice gentleman. And also I'd like to say that with the, uh, uh, especially with the cricket six decades of rock and roll memories that 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 book would have never ever seen the light of day unless it would have you know without uh uh tony warren peter fraser done it and peter gibson all from the uk you know we all worked as a team to get that book out with um and like i said it was definitely a group effort on that too so i want to thank that gentleman too if I could throw in one more name, Kevin Terry uh, is right up there with Bill Griggs. Uh, I think he's the undisputed champ of uh, everything uh, regarding that uh, plane crash. Uh, uh, is certainly a, a, a wonderful natural resource and a, a really wonderful uh, friend uh, to me when I was writing those books. Mm-hmm. It, you know, we'll uh, revisit... That that topic uh, later, but um, in the uh, winter dance party uh, later, um, you know we're uh, co- coming down to the end, and uh, you know this is uh, a really fascinating look at um, a more recent history of. The, uh, the evolution of pop culture. Um, you know, a lot of our shows are going back to Atlantis or um, you know, medieval times or something like that. But uh, I, uh, you two made this a really I- interesting show where you know, uh, you know we're st- still impacted by their legacies. Uh, some people. Um, may have remembered watching the ep- these episodes or hearing uh, Buddy's uh, songs when they first uh, came out. So you know, I think this was just a, a fantastic night of nostalgia and uh, kick, kicking around how so many of these people have continued to influence us today in such a good way. So, um... Yeah, so... And, you know, those websites, again, if you want to get get more information uh, about the uh, concert, uh, 85th birthday concert uh, this weekend, that was at uh, BuddyHollyHall.com and... The Serling Fest is uh, August what, 12th and 13th, and you can go to rodserling.com and, and get a little bit more information there. Uh, it, it, we have about two minutes left. Uh, w- w- what's the uh, best way that uh, people can find uh, both your books? Uh, Ryan, you want to start yeah, off there? Yeah. Uh... Sure. Uh, In Flanders Field, uh, Curious Death and Rebirth of Buddy Holly. Very pretentious title. Don't mind it. I was a little younger. Uh, that's available uh, on uh, uh, Amazon Prime uh, or Amazon, just Amazon. You can just uh, go on there. My other three books, uh, sadly, out of print, uh, but uh, one, one day I'll, I'll probably uh, – you know, try and do something uh, as far as uh, getting another getting another print and going. I, uh, but but uh, probably not in the near future. I'm so busy right now with uh, this uh, River Phoenix book. Okay. And, and uh, Gary, how about you? Well, this can be real simple: Amazon US or Amazon UK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So uh, we got through. Uh, about an hour and 59 minutes. We're down to uh, a few seconds. I, I just want to thank Gary and Ryan again. Thank you, Barbara, for producing this. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, we've got a whole bunch of stuff coming up this week. Uh, keep checking Barbara's website. And uh, we'll uh, keep keep you informed all week. 
Thank you. See, see everyone soon.